This is my new workstation for editing, gaming, coding, and just everyday use. Whoa, Brett, that thing looks tiny. Well, how's the old saying go? It's not the size of the benchmarks in the computer, it's the size of the computer in the benchmarks. That doesn't make any sense. But don't you worry, while yes, this is a tiny PC using a mobile tier CPU, it's pretty dang powerful. Oh, and we do have a little trick up our sleeves. Let's talk about it. All right, so two immediate questions. What is this thing and why is this thing? Well, it's the Atom Man X7 Ti from Minisform. It's a mini PC with the brand new Intel Core Ultra 9 185H, which is their newest Meteor Lake release with 16 total cores. We have six hyper-threaded cores that can boost up to 5.1 gigahertz, along with eight efficiency cores and two low power efficiency cores. Those low power cores are a new addition that can keep certain services running even when the computer is asleep, which makes sense for a laptop, but in a desktop PC, it's less exciting. This is a 45 watt TDP chip that also has built in art graphics, which appear to be a nice boost over the previous generation. If you don't go with the bare bones model, you can get one with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM and a one terabyte NVMe drive. These are both replaceable as you'll see later. For IO, I'm just gonna put it on the screen here and you can read it yourself, but the highlights are dual USB four ports, dual five gig RJ45 and an Oculink port. Yeah, Oculink. Then of course the elephant in the room, the thing you noticed when you first looked at this thing, it does come with a stand. Oh, the screen. Yeah, it's a four inch 480p touchscreen that displays information about your system as well as options for adjusting the volume and performance mode. Is it a gimmick? I mean, kinda, but at least it's a gimmick that has an actual use case. Another thing that's pretty cool is the built-in webcam, which has Windows Hello, and it's actually very usable. Okay, here's the webcam and Honestly, it looks pretty good even with pretty bad lighting right now. Are you gonna use it for streaming? Probably not, but it's fine. They've included a little toggle for when you're blowing your nose. And if you actually look on the back, oh my God, come on. This video is sponsored by Ugreen and their 100 watt Nexo charger. As you probably guessed, it can output up to 100 watts to a single device or spread it out amongst the three USB-C or one USB-A port. This is quite literally the charger I keep in my everyday bag since it's all I need for my MacBook, phone, AirPods, and whatever miscellaneous object I have. If you're interested, you can check out the Nexode 100 watt charger along with the entire Nexode lineup using the link down in the description below. So yeah, that's what it is, but why is this my new workstation? Surely that's clickbait. Well, this time it's not. You see, the Thunderbolt ports on my main workstation Asus board died, and since I literally just bought a $400 cable to have Thunderbolt from that machine to my office, I want that fixed. Which means we get to play on the Asus RMA merry-go-round, or as some people like to call it, Russian roulette. So yeah, I need a new workstation in the meantime, and surely you have another PC to use, right? Well, yeah, but what's the fun in that? So I actually asked you guys what you'd like to see, then ignored you and went with this for two reasons. One is because Minisform had already sent it over for me to review, and two, it's got uh, this thing, an external GPU dock which makes perfect use of that Oculink port. Great, so you've got the whole story now, so how does it compare? Well, I'm coming from a setup with an i9-13900K and a 4090, so obviously it's not gonna be as good, but Spoiler alert, it's definitely good enough. Now, there are two ways to approach reviews like this with numbers and benchmarks or with more of a real world subjective perspective. So before I did anything, I wanted to give it the best shot. So I maxed out the RAM in here with 96 gigabytes. To get in here, you have to remove the rubber feet, unscrew the four screws, then pop the cover off. Then make sure you don't remove the four motherboard screws like I did, cause to access the RAM in your M.2 slots, you just have to remove these zillion tiny screws on the fan shroud. Then you can see we have a full length M.2 slot and a 30 millimeter slot along with two RAM sticks. They included this, what I'm guessing is thermal tape. I just transferred it to the new RAM. Not sure if that matters. But yeah, decent upgradability. Right out of the gate, this thing scores a 1013 in Cinebench 2024, which means nothing by itself, but look at the processors it falls between. That's higher than a high-end AMD desktop chip from just a generation ago. Note that all of these numbers I'll be talking about are without the GPU, which I'll talk about later. 
When running the test, we saw a power draw of about 100 watts with temperatures sitting comfortably in the 70s for the most part with a few peaks into the 90s. For a mini PC like this, that's pretty dang good. The 100 watts is a little high, but at idle it only uses about 17 watts, so that's good. It only has one fan that exhausts at the top, but they're calling it cold wave phase change cooling system. I think it's just regular heat pipes, but it seems to work well. In terms of noise, it's no different than a normal laptop, probably not as bad as a dual fan gaming one though. Geekbench shows a similar trend with a score of 13,323, putting it just above an M2 Pro MacBook in multi-core, but a little bit behind in single core. Great, but this thing does have integrated art graphics, so how do those perform? Well, pretty good. Esports titles are no problem here, even in 4K, so for those kinds of things, it's plenty good enough. Real games will require a bit more finesse and sacrifice in terms of quality or resolution, which is to be expected. I'd like to be able to play AAA titles in 4K with a high FPS on mobile integrated graphics, but like, I'd also like to have 100K subs, and neither of those is true. Unless... But these art graphics do have a trick with Intel's XESS, which is their super sampling technique to rival NVIDIA's DLSS and AMD's FSR. It's basically a trick to render the game differently and insert frames based on learning algorithms to give you a higher FPS. If we utilize this in games that support it, we can actually get a playable experience. But realistically, nobody's buying this to game on. I know that. But even at 1080p low medium settings with no super sampling, the fact that we can get 30 FPS in a heavy AAA title like Cyberpunk is crazy. And someone had a really good question on the live stream where I was messing around with this. Personally, I find it a bit weird to test games on a non-gaming uh, PC. You're doing it right now and LTT was doing it with the new ARM laptops. Can you share why you do that? It's a good way to provide a somewhat consistent benchmark of the hardware inside in a form that a lot of people can easily ingest and comprehend. Another thing here in terms of the integrated graphics is that we still have Intel's QuickSync and excellent transcoding hardware. This is probably the most important part to me since the real work that's done on my workstation is with DaVinci Resolve and Photoshop. In DaVinci Resolve, it's a very usable experience. I loaded up my last project and had no problem scrubbing around my timeline, which is a mix of 4K ProRes, H.264, and large image files, and then some graphics. Intel's built-in H.264 decoders make sure playback stays fairly smooth for those clips, and the ProRes is just easy on hardware in general. We do start to see some sluggishness when dealing with those large web page captures since they're pretty high res and injecting text with like changes in opacity and all that good stuff. I'm not going to pretend it's not noticeable, but it's still a very usable experience. Exporting the project will give us a good target for how this hardware handles the entire hodgepodge of media. The 6 minute and 43 second project rendered in H.264 took 8 minutes and 34 seconds, or about 133% of the project length. Cool. Is that good? Uh, I wouldn't say it's good for a professional. But again, that's not really fair because a professional probably isn't using this. Just to give you a frame of reference, how long do you think it took my regular workstation to render this same project? Yep, one minute and 56 seconds, just under six minutes faster, which may not sound like a lot, but that's roughly 30% of the project length versus 133%. When you're exporting projects multiple times due to revisions or dealing with more complex or longer projects, that adds up. Just to have some fun with it, let's try it on my M1 Pro MacBook Pro. That came in at 9 minutes and 2 seconds, actually slower than the Adamant. Impressive. In Photoshop, it's more of a subjective feel since it's hard to quantify the experience. I will say while my regular workstation chews through large 6K projects with no issues, this does seem to struggle. If you're working with a more reasonable canvas size like 1080p for thumbnails, it's perfectly fine. So yeah, in terms of performance, I think it's actually very impressive for what it is. For a small desktop setup for light gaming and moderate content creation, it's solid. However, there was always a trick up our sleeve. Using the Oculink port to connect their DEG1 GPU dock is pretty freaking dope. 
And the dock is only like $100, I believe, which is crazy affordable. I don't know that it's officially released at the time of making this video, so take that with a grain of salt. Now, what this dock does is pick up where the X7 is lacking, and that's in graphical performance. I threw an RTX 3060 in here because I felt that was a nice mid-level card to pair with this setup. And before we talk about performance, let me just quickly talk about the build of this thing. There are two things I like about it and one that I don't. I really like the fact that it turns on and off with the system. I've had nightmares about other eGPU docks requiring me to manually turn them on and off separately from the main system. I also like the open air design as you can fit a much larger card and officially a three slot card. What I don't like is the open air design because there's nowhere to hide your cables. Kind of a minor complaint, but whatever. So with this thing connected, it's pretty much like using a regular desktop system. One caveat though, is that the Oculink connection is a four lane connection using PCIe Gen 4 speeds. This means that the card doesn't have access to the full 16 lanes that a typical GPU is used to, and even half of the eight lanes you sometimes see a card run at. How that bandwidth limitation affects everything will be dependent on the card itself and how you're using it, but that's outside the scope of this video, so I'll just show you how it works for me. Obviously, gaming is going to improve drastically. That's a no-brainer. Outside of the raw performance increase, we also have access to NVIDIA's arguably superior DLSS technology. What about editing though? Well, scrubbing is about the same, but those GPU-assisted graphics are much easier to work with, and of course, our export time improved as well. Leveraging the GPU for encoding and effects brought our time down to four minutes and 59 seconds. Is this gonna be as good as throwing a GPU in a desktop system with access to 16 lanes of bandwidth? Probably not, but it's a very drastic improvement for those that need the option. Okay, self-reflection time. We've seen the numbers, we've seen how I use it. I've claimed that's an awesome PC, so should you buy it? Ah, this is a tough call. It really is. I'm a huge fan of mini PCs getting more capable and more powerful, but you're still paying the price for it. The bare bones version is $670, and the 32 gig one terabyte model is 850, which is actually a pretty good price compared to others with similar specs. But we need to think less about it being a good deal compared to other models and whether the feature set justifies the price. Because for $850, you can build a desktop system that will be more powerful, quieter, and allow for more expansion. But if you prioritize size, power efficiency, and a four inch touchscreen, then who am I to say no? I mean, it's not an outlandish price for the performance you get, so if you like it, get it. But that's all I have for this one. Links to both of these are down in the description below. Let me know what you guys think. Give me a yay or nay with supporting evidence in the comments. If you like this video, then drop a like. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my mini PC with a four inch touch screen. You guys are the best. And if you're still watching, you're an Asus RMA. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one.